So I'm just going to take you through a few different things. Um, I just want to start off by talking about a few little things with reason seven. Um, did it, was anybody here last year at A to D? Yeah. yeah. I don't know if you heard that I did a little I did a little thing there. And one of the things that I was sort of saying was that one of the things I loved about reason was the fact that it was very open ended. And even though I didn't have any groups in the mixer, snigger snigger, which makes your life really, really difficult. Um, at that point I knew they were coming, but they weren't here yet. And it was a bit of a, it's a bit of a sort of pain in the backside in the sense that we had to do this kind of thing. I, don't, I mean, those of you that are sort of, you've been using Reason for a while. Here what I've got is a whole bunch of my drums. Um, it's just going, I'm going to have to sit down actually. I did, I tried to stand up and, do, and show you what I was talking about there, but unfortunately it's not going to work. Um, so that's just similar to that little section there. Let me zip over to the mixer. Um, so what I had to do for my drums here, sorry, not my solo and get rather easy, is I would have to go and root all of this stuff out, take the individual outs or the direct outs from the tracks, and I would have to take those into the 14-2 uh, mixer, which looks a lot like a Mackie mixer, incidentally. Um, and then if I wanted a parallel, um, and I'll talk a little bit about using parallels today, because um, it's kind of a big, it's that big kind of buzzword for mixing and for production. Um, if I wanted to create a parallel, then what I would have to do is I'd have to create a spider and take a feed from the mixer, that out to pulverizer, back into a mix channel, my parallel compression channel. Basically, it was a pain in the ass. Okay, so it was quite difficult to do. Um, so if I just load up the same session, that I've conveniently redone for reason seven, um, add some outside in. Um, incidentally, actually, on the product page for Reason 7, the video that's been, that they've used is called Reason has a Mac, uh, sorry, Reason has a rack for mix and effort now. Um, they are using this track, so actually, even though I didn't really want to use this, because I showed some of you this last year, actually, in some ways it shows an evolution of the way that Reason now um, works. So, just to be clear about what's happening here is, Propeller hits have now added proper groups to the mixer, thank goodness, okay? So in other words, what I've done is I've got a whole bunch of tracks here, which you can see, all of my drums, and I've sent those to a drum sub. Now at any point, I can take anything out of a group, so in other words, all I do, if I want to create a group, is I just multiple select a whole bunch of um, channels, and I just hit either Command G, or I click on New Output Bus, okay? And it puts them into a group. Um, it's, it, it, by default it will solo safe, so what that means is that either, if I go and solo these drums here, you can see, um, let's just go up to a little section, let's go up to this bit here, so if I play them. So there's none of this nonsense of me going, right, okay, I solo the group, and then I have to go through and solo individual instruments. They are by default, you can see there's a kind of faint solo, um, icon there that's being lit up in a kind of faint green colour, they are already soloed. Now, of course, if I want to go and solo the kick, no problem. Or any individual part of that. Okay? And it's very, very easy for me also to go and assign any of those outputs, if I actually click in the right place, to any of the other groups within my session. Or, for that matter, if I want to just take it out of the groups and just send it straight to the master fader, that's also really, really easy to do. I'm just going to put that back in my drum slot. So all of the so all of those kind of all of the nitty gritty. I don't I don't really want to spend too much time talking about groups, other than the fact that when I'm mixing something, um, it's a logical thing for me to kind of separate everything out into groups. It just makes it a little easier to mix. Now another feature which people ask for a lot of reason users. Um, um, do any of you use parallel any parallel processing? Um, I say parallel processing because it gets misrepresented in the sense that people think parallel compression is the only form of parallel processing, and parallel can be parallel anything. Um, so to an extent, if I have a deficiency, actually, if, just, just thinking about this, let me just switch over to another session, because I think this is probably a, a better session to show you. Um, say I have a scenario like this, 
this session here, where I have just a drum loop. So I've got basically this. Let me just wait for that. Okay, it doesn't sound too pretty. Deliberately, I don't want to make it sound too pretty. Let's just go into this little section here, to the verse. I'm just going to loop that. Um, let's just play from there. Okay, so what we've got here is we've got some, uh, we've got a drum loop here. And what I've done is, the first thing I've done actually is, I listened to it, and to my ears, it sounded, it sounded okay. It didn't really have any bottom end to it. Um, so what I'm doing is, I've quickly created, and because it's only a, a loop, there's, there's no separate kick here, snare, hi-hat, overheads, etc. So in a sense, I'm kind of limited straight away from the off. So what I've done, is I've created a bunch of parallel channels um, based upon that original channel that I have here uh, for the drum. So, in other words, I've started with this, and what I've done is I've thought, actually, that has a deficiency there, so what I need is I need some low end. Um, and all I've done is gone up to the edit menu, um, and all I've done is I've said, right, what I want to do here, actually what I have to do is I have to select this one because of the way the parallels work. Um, is I, I straight away what I want to do is I want to just say okay on the basis of something like da, 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 this channel here um, I just want to create a parallel channel okay and what it does if I just flip around the back in the rack here is let's just go to the rack so we haven't really got a huge amount of screen real estate here what it does is it just takes the, literally the last track that you've got selected and it takes a pre-fade feed from that into the input of a new channel. Now, those of you that have been using Reason for a while know that that was quite complicated to do. Okay, so that's all one keystroke now. It's a little, it's, that's a lot easier to, to kind of do if you like. Um, I'm going to get rid of that because I don't actually want that one. I'm just going to go back to the mixer. So what I've done here is I've taken that initial um, drum part and I've said, okay, right. What I want to do is I'm actually just going to deliberately take out quite a lot of the top end from that sound. So let's just talk a little bit maybe about some of the EQ that I've done in here. Let's just take that one out for a second. Um, so I'm using the filters here to kind of maybe take that down maybe to about sort of 50, 60 hertz. Um, 50, 60 hertz, that's kind of the fundamental frequency for a kick drum. Um, obviously, when I start mixing something, what I tend to do is I tend to start by uh, sorting out the bottom end of the track. So in other words, drums and, and, and bass are the first things that I focus on. Um, I try not to work in solo. Um, if you work in solo, what happens is you do, it, what happens is you make everything sound individually quite good and then you put it together and it sounds terrible because everything's kind of taking up too much space. Um, in this instance, you won't be able to hear what I'm doing, so I have to mix in solo, in a sense, or I have to backtrack and show you what I've done. Um, so, first of all, with this, um, I've actually taken some top end off of these drums. Um, arguably, because I know what I'm going to do with another parallel, I could even do maybe something like that, where maybe I'm also filtering, I'm using a low pass filter to take some of the top end out as well. Um, the whole idea of the parallel channels is they're completely phase coherent. So in other words, if you copy something, if you copy a channel, um, the timing is not going to... But because we're working from the original piece of audio, we're not actually copying any of the audio. Um, those are kind of locked together, if you like, in terms of there's no shift in timing. Um, the other thing which we've also got in here, uh, in terms of the EQ, there's also a spectrum EQ. I don't know whether uh, Matthias mentioned this at all. Um, so there's also, uh, you can also, get, going back to what we just talked about on the panel, hey, if you want, you can also look at the EQ um, as well as actually listen to it. I mean, obviously I was going on about how I would encourage people to actually listen to it. Um, so in other words, what I can do with this, if I want, I can kind of, I can do it that way if I want. If I want to vary the Q, if I just press the on key, I can also change the Q. Even though I'm not a huge fan of 
looking at EQ, I like to listen to it. Actually, um, I really like this because actually, in a way, it kind of shows you what the what the EQ does on a real SSL. Now, um, you know, you probably noticed in the EQ section here, there's a little button that says um, E. Now, basically, what we've done is they modelled when they modelled this, they modelled this on a, a, a 9000 uh, J series, um, which in kind of um, everyday speak is a kind of gentler sound. It's a more open sound. The, the early SSLs were very, they were a bit lo-fi. They also had the, all the channels, they all went through VCA, so in other words, they're a little more crunchy. Anyway, um, but what they've done here is they've given the option, given you the option here of using the EQ. If I, if I flick that button, um, between E and effectively uh, J or K mode, um, what that means is that it's a little more lo-fi, you've got narrower cues in here um, for that sound. So if you listen to if you listen to those drums and you kind of compare it, you can hear that's a little gentler. Maybe that. Now the downside of that is it's a little more phasey. Um, the cool thing with this spectrum EQ is I can actually see that. Yeah, so actually I'm quite a big fan of this. Spectrum EQ. A um, couple of other things that are also quite useful with this is if I flick between the channels, I can I can also I can quickly see how the other channels are being EQ. Now this is something you've never been able to do in Reason before. Is you can also go and select a channel in the sequencer window, and you can also flick between any of those in here. Yeah. There's also a spectrograph as well. So if you um, I can already hear, I'm using uh, these fantastic requested speakers in here, and I can already hear that, uh, uh, that uh, what I did in my hotel room last night was add some bottom end, and I can hear I added way too much to the second parallel channel that I've got here. Um, but the key thing is, not only can I, uh, I, not only can I actually uh, hear it, I can also see some, I can see some of that, some of that kind of low energy. Now, that, those two on the, sort of on their own, they, they, they're, not, they're not going to sound very nice at all. So what I've done is I've created another parallel here. Let's just hear this in solo. Which sounds very bright. So hopefully, when I start to put these, maybe I might just, just cater for the room here, a little less of that. And then what I also want is I want another channel where I can really crush those drums to give them a bit more attitude. So I've created another parallel here. Let's just hear that go. Okay, where I'm really crushing that sound. Let's just go and have another little look. Let's get F2, let's get rid of that. Let's just go and have a little look at what I'm doing on the channel there. Um, so I'm kind of, um, I'm using a lot of filters. If I take those filters out, The other thing, actually, I'm, I'm always changing my mind about things. Actually, I might also decide I want to compress it a little more here as well. Um, key little tip here with using the with using the dynamics on an SSL is if you don't know what they what, what they do and you want them to be quite harsh, very easy. Just turn the ratio all the way up, make it a fast release, and adjust the taste with the threshold. So you can hear if I I can really completely destroy it. By the way. Okay. Um, what I'm actually uh, what I'm actually doing on this channel is if I just zip over to the rack quickly uh, with the crush, I'm using uh, a plug-in that all of you have, or a, I suppose we should probably call it a rack device that all of you are using, which is pulverizer. Pulverizer. Um, pulverizer is a is a really really neat um, tool. It's a really neat dynamic tool in the. Um, we can create what I would call negative compression, whereby you can make the quieter things louder than the loud things. Um, it's, it's loosely modeled on something. Um, I don't know if any of you remember the listen mic, uh, there's, a, there's a thing called the listen mic compressor on, a, on an SSL, on the, on the hardware. And basically what this was for is if a whole bunch of people were sitting in a studio, and or musicians were playing in the live room, and you needed to be able to hear what they were saying, they, they had this, Little, um, they had this little microphone which was, uh, which was rooted through this uh, really nasty sound compressor with nothing above 4K, nothing uh, below about 400 hertz. So in other words, what it was done is it was designed to pick up, it was designed for speech, so to pick up the sound. Now, an engineer called Hugh Padgham, who some of you may have heard, um, 
for his work with uh, police and um, Genesis, Phil Collins. Um, he created that now quite famous Collins drum sound, which basically was created with using the listen mic compressor for a purpose that it wasn't intended. Um, and it, and, and, and the, the characteristic was that you could create this kind of negative compression effect, whereby it, actually I could, I could probably do a similar thing by using an expander, but it's maybe it's maybe I'm doing it. So, so what I'm doing is I'm combining those. So let's have a little listen to those things here. Um, into my drum sub. So if I wanted to, I could just get rid of those and solo my drum sub. Now. Easy for me to misuse this whole kind of parallel thing, and I thought, well, why not? I'll misuse it. So, with my, with my drum stop here, which by the way, I've also got a little bit of EQ on the drum sub, um, I have created another parallel feed here from the sub to do this thing. Now, the key, <coughs> it's a kind of different flavour. The other one was quite bright, wasn't it? It was, it was, it was aggressive, but it was very bright. And what I, what I've noticed is that maybe I've, I've taken a little too much of the, the bottom end out there. Um, the other thing I'm using here is uh, ART. I don't know if any of you know. If you upgrade to Reason Seven, you get this uh, rack extension for free. Let me just flick over to the rack here. Open this up. Some of you may have seen this. This is a new RE called the Audiomatic Retro Transformer. You've got to love that Swedish sense of humour. Um, how would I describe this? This is kind of... How many people here use Instagram? In, this is kind of Instagram for audio. Okay? In the, it's cheating a, a, a bit. In the, they're, they're kind of preset uh, algorithms, but there's some really, really funky ones in here. If I just do some. Um, I'm using the VHS, but there's a vinyl in here. There's some fairly, there's some fairly weird ones in here, like I like turn eerie. It certainly is eerie, isn't it? There's a washing machine. Yeah, I love that one too. Circuit. So if you want to do that kind of um, that, that sort of eight bit, I'm trying to think of that. Uh, that little device, what was it called? Not Bit Crusher. There was a, somebody made a, a little hardware device which used to do this kind of um, thing. Um, MP3. If you want to, actually, one of the things that I've discovered here is from messing around with this, the tape setting. It's okay. It's a little bit kind of brutal for me. It's kind of crushed a little too much. One of the things I found is that using the the bottom, which is kind of like a a bass boost, if you like. If I adjust the dry and wet in here, let me just take the filters off. Otherwise, what you're hearing is an EQ version. Let's quickly take that off just for a second. That's better. So, what you've got here, that's like the extreme bottom end. So, if you back that off and then maybe mix it in with the original, that to my ear sounds more like tape. Or tape the way I remember it anyway. So, Audiomatic Retro Transformer. Uh, isn't rocket science, it's kind of just a, an input. Um, the, the gain is quite useful because you can drive um, the effect a little harder. Um, you know what, I haven't got a clue what setting I was using on here originally, I think it was that. You know what, when I'm mixing I've changed my mind, nothing is ever said. Yeah, do, do you know that great quote George Massenberg said to him, so George, when is the mix finished? And he says it's now finished, it's just abandoned. And that, that kind of sums up my life in terms of mixing. Mm. <coughs> so, auto automatic retro transformer. So what I'm trying to do is, I've showed you two or three new little features. I don't know if any of you saw Matthias' presentation earlier. He kind of took you through the versions using the uh, the new warping thing, and also, most importantly, MIDI out. Um, I'm not going to talk about those, so I'm kind of just going to talk about a few more mixing techniques. So, um, I have my drum sound. I'm quite happy with it. Let's just hear that, maybe with both of those. And now what I want to do is I want to add the bass, okay? So let's just, first of all, let's just listen to what we have in the bass. I'm just going to flick over here. Um, let's see this guy. I need to actually 
take a look at what I'm doing I'm here to remind myself. Okay, right, with the EQ, it's just a little bit nondescript, isn't it? Um, probably what I would do in a, in, a, in a normal situation here is I would want to solo the kick with this, but I don't really have the kick, uh, I, I don't have the kick isolated, so basically, um, I'm just what I'm going to do is I'm just going to check this just by soloing the... <coughs> Now what I'm doing in the EQ is where the fundamental frequency of a kick um, is usually between 50 and 60 hertz. For this genre of music, bear in mind, it could be different if you're doing a hip hop track, doing an R&B track, you may decide actually I want the sub to be in the bass, not the kick. So maybe the kick would sit above um, the bass. The key thing here is they can't both sit in the same area, okay? So what I'm doing here with the bass is I'm boosting, where, where I'm boosting the low end on the kick, and I mean even though I don't have the drum separated, I'm still boosting down quite low here, about 80 hertz, this one down about 60 hertz, okay? So instantly I know I can't really boost the bass in the same area, so what I'm doing is I'm boosting that up at about, probably about 110 hertz. Now, conveniently, this track is in A, so I don't know if you ever, do any of you ever work out the key of the track, just so that you know, so you know where those, you know, where those frequencies are, yeah? Um, I mean, it's, it doesn't completely work like that, in the sense that a sound is, is made up of harmonics as well as a fundamental frequency, but it's often a good idea to be aware where those areas are, because they could be a problem if there's too much level, maybe in the, with the fundamental frequency, or maybe not enough. Okay, so you know, that, you know the scenario when you're playing a bass and you go from an A up to a D, and the A is really loud, and the D just disappears. It's like, did somebody hit the mute button on, on the desk? Um, it's, it's, it's all about the harmonics. So what I've done here with the bass is I'm, I'm kind of looking for the area where it won't get in the way of the kick. Now, another technique I could use there, of course, you might have spotted, let me just zoom out a little. On the bass low here, what I decided to do, I thought, well, actually, that's not enough low end for me. So, what I'll do is, but I thought, well, actually, if I go and do that um, and I just boost the whole low end, it's going to get very muddy down there. So, what I'm also doing is I'm triggering the compressor. You can see I've got the key input here in the dynamic section, and I'm triggering that from the drums, okay? So, what I'm doing is I'm just, I don't know if you can see if I take that out. But the whole idea is that whenever you hear the kick, I'm just doubling the place very slightly. Can you hear if I take the key out what happens? It's just a little tighter, isn't it? They kind of work, they gel together. So basically what I'm saying to you is if you are going to add frequencies in the same area, then with, with the bass, with, well, bass and drums we're talking about here, you're going to have to find a way of controlling that, and a way of controlling that is maybe to duck that a little, okay? Um, now, the other thing I'm doing with the bass here, I've got three parallels, you can tell I'm, I'm in love with parallels at the moment, probably in a week's time I'll change my mind and won't be in love with them. Um, so, so, we've got the, the kind of more metallic sound of bass, but what I really want is I want something to give the bass a little top end, so, I have this one here, and I'm using a very, very drastic EQ on this. Let's see if I take those. So, what I want to use this for is I want to actually chorus the sound of the bass, okay? So, if I just zip over to the rack here, let me see. In here, I'm using a screen. <coughs> on the knees of the easy fuzz setting, which I really like. But I'm also using this little device. Now, these is, there's a weird thing for reason. There's, I've noticed that a lot of those devices that, that have always been there have got kind of forgotten. Um, this is a great little chorus unit, really, really good. But the key thing that I'm doing here that, that, that I need to, to stress is that I've had to EQ the bass to send it to the chorus, because I don't want all of this low-end wash going to a chorus. Because what will happen is you'll get all of this 
much going on. Yeah. Um, the other thing which I kind of so so in other words, let's, let's just quickly hear what's going on. I've got my bass sub here. Let's unmute that, and I've got my drum sub going. <laughs> Now, the other thing which is also playing quite a big part in this, which is worth mentioning at this point, is this guy, which is the bus compressor. Now, I know I talk, I, talk, I, I don't really want to repeat what I said to you last year, otherwise you'll think I always talk about exactly the same thing, but I think it's worth just quickly mentioning this, this bus compressor. Sorry, I haven't got a mic, so I'm going to have to turn it down a little. Now, um, <coughs> The thing which I'm doing with this compressor is I'm using it as a kind of form of glue, if you like, to kind of glue the whole sound together. Um, and, I, I, and I remember last year when I spoke to you guys, I think a few people, there are a few raised eyebrows when I said, I always put this on at the beginning of the mix, I don't put it on at the end of the mix. So in other words, what I do is I tend to mix into this compressor. Okay? Come and join the party if you want to. No, they don't. They don't want to know about us. Um, so, the, the, the problem you have with putting this compressor over a whole mix is that the low end energy will tend to dictate how the gain reduction behaves, okay? So in other words, you have this kind of scenario where, so if I turn the threshold up maybe a little more, you can see the needle there. Basically, what I've had to do is I've had to create a side chain. So let's just zip over to the rack. Have a look over here. Um, what I've done is I've created, using a spider and using an EQ, um, I'm actually going to be a bit more drastic with this in a moment, just so that you can really see how this behaves. Let me try and view both of these. Um, so there's the bus compressor, which you can see, and there is the EQ. Now let me just flick the rack around. So just to be clear about what I'm doing is I'm taking the master output into a spider, one feed is going out to the speakers, which is what you're hearing. The other feed is going into this EQ, which I've got, and then the EQ, out of the EQ and back in to the side chain. And there's a neat little thing you can do in Reason. If you just control click and you just say scroll to connected, it will always take you. Actually, the other thing I should do here is hit K and hide a few cables as well. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm using that EQ to dictate how the compressor behaves. So let's just hit the game. Maybe if I take, if you watch the needle, and maybe let's do something a little more drastic. Let's maybe what frequency we've got here, about 2K. If I do something like that, let's see it. So you can see with that with the with the needle there, it's hardly working at all. So actually, I can use that compressor um, in conjunction with a side chain, I can kind of use that like an EQ. Because what I'm doing is, I'm, it's like a multi-band uh, compressor if you like. What I'm doing is I'm dictating where the compressor works and where it doesn't work. Okay? And the key thing is, is to remove some of that bottom end so that when I go and do that, what I'm not getting is I'm not having too much compression in the low end. Okay? Any questions on that? It's a, it's a kind of fairly basic way. You, you know, weirdly enough, it's, it's quite funny this actually because I was talking to some people about this. A real SSL didn't have a side chain actually. But what you could do is you could take it apart. <laughs> so in other words, you could basically flip up the master section or you could pull out a, sound, a card and it actually it did have uh, a, 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 a side chain detector and what people would do is they'd modify it. So it would probably be fixed at about 100 hertz, whereby what would happen is you wouldn't get anything happening in your mix below about 100 hertz. Uh, to, or, or you, wouldn't get, you wouldn't have any co compression on anything below about 100 hertz. Okay? Um, Where do you put the compressor on at the start rather than at the end? Because it makes up part of the sound, what happens is the, kind of the stereo spread, um, the way that the whole mix interacts is that the, the compressor is part of that sound. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing it the other way, but what will happen is you'll have to backtrack in your mix, because I can almost guarantee that something will dictate how it behaves. Um, you ideally shouldn't really, if I just zoom in there again very quickly, ideally you shouldn't be using a ratio of more than two to one over a mix, 
and you shouldn't really be using a fairly fast attack. So uh, by that, what I mean is the attack, attack's kind of counterintuitive, isn't it? Because if you have a slow attack on your track, you have more attack. You have to think about that one. What, what is this dude on about? What is he going on about? Um, so what that means is that we're letting the initial transients through. So the slower the attack, the more of the initial set of transients that come through in our mix, okay? So, whereas if I do something more like this, it's a little bit, it's a little bit squash, actually. Let me, let me squash it a bit more. The kick is now definitely starting to dictate what the compressor's doing. Whereas if I now maybe <coughs> So the, the, the way that the attack works, as I said to you, it always sounds, when I'm explaining to you, it always feels like it's kind of counterintuitive, but what it's doing is, it's like an envelope. I mean, I don't know if any of you heard Richard speaking in here earlier. It's like having an envelope control over your, over your compression. Any questions with that? I know that was your question. Did I answer your question? Uh, yeah. 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 Anybody else? Any? points to raise there. Okay, um, let's zoom back out again. Let's go look at some other things in this session. Um, let's see, how's Dora? I'm not really done just closing it, much as I love listening to it, but that's it. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, I gave him a look. <laughs> yeah. Or oh, just go, oh, we can close this door if you like, if you don't, because he, he'll probably need to keep going into his room. That's okay. Um, it's alright, I know something. It's right. so I can say that. Um, let's go and have a little look at the vocal. Let's see what we've done to the vocal. Well, not me, not what I've done. I should take responsibility for my actions. So there we go. Let's just turn this down. But I'm gonna fight. Say that from the beginning. It's not about all the words they tell you. I know what's right. They say I made all the wrong Okay, so a couple of things. Once again, as I said to you, parallel channels are now my new friend, and I'm going to use them extensively. Um, so I'm using the parallel feature that we talked about earlier slightly differently here. Um, I'm using it, well, twofold actually, with the vocal. When I listen to it, it's like, Visions, but I'm gonna fight. It lacks a bit of warmth. So what I'm doing is I'm using two things here. First of all, I'm going to talk about these in uh, talk about this one first, then I'll talk about the one in the middle. Don't tell me what to do, because I know now, that I'm on its own it doesn't sound very nice, but I'm just using it to add a little warmth. Um, the key thing with these parallel channels is it, it's actually very easy to overuse them. We're still, Mateus and I are still very excited about them, so we're probably prone to using them lots. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm using Done with the two. superficial truth. You know, hearing all these quested speakers makes me want to change my mix. <laughs> Actually, it sounds too dull to me now. Um, but what I'm doing with these, with, the, with these parallel channels, if we just zip up here to the EQ, you can see I'm using, once again, quite a lot of filtering um, on, these, on these two uh, signals. So um, if we just go back to the lead box here, let's just go and have a look. Through the fire, it's not about all the words they tell you. I'm compressing a little, a little bit of dynamic control. Not too brutal actually, weirdly enough, which is strange for me because I normally I am quite I am quite extreme with it. Um, I'm taking a little <coughs> bit of low end out there. Um, the EQ, let's have a little look at it on the spectrum EQ. So I'm kind of. I know what's right. Let's just take that. They say I made all the wrong decisions. Have you ever heard people speaking in the room on this vocal, by the way? You know, they're in the background going, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Probably I should have switched over to the other session, but anyway, there we go. Um, once again, if I were to, if I were to, if we listen to this um, vocal. But I'm gonna fight. You can see, if I switch that into E mode once again, the curves become a little, or the Q on the curves become a little more extreme. Um, it's a kind of more lo-fi approach to that. So <laughs> don't tell me what to do, cause I know well, that I'm game. done with the superficial truth. Through the fire, it's not about all the work. You can hear actually.
actually quite good for radio, but weirdly enough, a little bit phasey. So, if I switch that back out of, can you now see? First they tell you. A little bit right now, because it's boosting more of the signal, okay? Whereas with the E-mode, it was a bit more like that. So maybe I need to back it off a little, just bring that down. I know what's right. That, that makes me happy now. It sounds a little better to my ears. Um, now, one of the problems with me um, EQing the vocal like that is, if I'm sending that signal um, to effects, or in this case, I'm sending it to an echo, what will happen is as soon as the singer hits a T or an S or any of those kind of sibilant sounds or, or plosives, anything like that, that will be kind of, if you like, that will be tenfold as soon as it's sent to a delay or something. Or you kind of, you'll have to live with it for how many, how many, ever many of the repeats you have. So, what I've done is I've created another parallel signal here. They say I made all the wrong decisions. We just take out the sense of effect. So on its own, once again, it doesn't sound particularly nice, but actually it's very good for sending to the delay. Yeah? Don't tell me, me what you to do, because I know that I'm done. We listen to the vocal. I'm going to take the filters out. It's not about all the words they tell you. I know what's right. Can you, hear all, can you hear all the S's in the delay, okay? So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to use that parallel feed to minimise the effect of that. Once again, I'm change Maybe that's too much. Yeah? <coughs> the delay is not taking up as much space in the mix. Um, one of the things which I always try and stress to people is, is when you're, when you're um, viewing, or when you, when you look at what effects you've used in the mix, um, people tend to forget that they take up as much space as some of the instruments quite often. So you have to kind of treat those. You need some dynamic control on those. Um, so that's why I've created the parallel feed there. Um, on the vocal, let's just make sure I haven't got the wrong session here. I believe I'm also doing something else in here. Let's just zip over to the rack. Um, let's have a little look over here. Where is my vocal? My vocal is down. Um, what I'm also doing here is I'm also using the, the send to the, uh, to the reverb. Let's just open this up. Um, I've got the ESO. My send, sorry, I have to go back to the mixer. I'm in the wrong session, so I'm kind of not above. Yeah, what I'm doing here is I'm also sending to a reverb duct box flow. There you go, there's my clue. Okay, so send seven. I'm sending to a reverb, but what I'm doing is I've got a compressor after the reverb because I want to duck the sound of that reverb. So let's just solo this channel. <coughs> and I'm just gonna go over here. Don't tell me what to do, cause let's just zip over to the rack here, up into the master section, flip that around just so you can see what I'm doing. So send seven here. If I just control click on that, scroll to selected device, we can see down here what I've got open this up. We've got um, a compressor. Actually, I'm also using a stereo imager on it as well. But the key thing is, I'm feeding the lead vocal reverb, the famous RV7000. There's still a big place for the RV7000. Don't forget it, just because these, there's all these great REs around now. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm feeding the vocal into this reverb. Don't know that I'm done. But what I'm doing, if you, can, if you look at the gain reduction here in, uh, with the compressor, is I'm also using that to duck the, the effect of the reverb whenever she's singing. And the way I'm doing that is I'm purely taking, uh, I'm, I'm actually using the parallel out feed from um, the channel, and I'm taking that via a spider into the compressor. If we flip that around, you can see on the side chain input, I'm just taking the output from the vocal and I'm ducking um, the sound uh, using the uh, compressor there. Okay. With the superficial so truth. We can abuse that by through the fire. It's not about all the words. So I can actually almost dry the vocal out. And maybe if I were to let's actually let's go I'm using let's use a different reverb in here. What's a really long one in here? All the film score, that's the best one. All film score, is that at the top? Yes yeah. it is. All film yeah, let's take a really extreme example. <laughs> so Stay tell you let's take the threshold up. I know what's right. They say I made all the wrong decisions, but I'm... So, the reverb's taking up quite a lot of space. If I just back off the compressor, oh, sorry, if I 
bring the threshold up on the compressor. Gonna fight. Don't tell me what to do, cause I know that I'm done. What it's doing is it's kind of drying out the vocal when she's singing, but when she stops singing, it allows the reverb to kind of um, bloom at the end of the word, if that makes or at the end of the line, if that makes sense. Um, any questions on that? Um, Sorry, is, is, is that sort of slightly different from pre-delay? It's, 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 it's different, but actually pre-delay is, pre is also a really useful thing to separate. If you want to separate the direct sound from the reverberated sound, that is also a good way, and, and, and once again, another way of creating separation. Um, so I've kind of used my little allotted time there, and I've just shown you two or three. I, I actually spent quite a long time on the bass and drums, and I did that deliberately because that is the hardest thing. I often find when I'm mixing it, if I can get the bass and the drums happening, then everything kind of sits on top. Now, word of advice, don't leave it too long before you put the vocal in. I know there's a kind of mentality where what, what, what we tend to do is we tend to mix something and then go, oh shit, uh, vocal, right. You put the vocal in and you suddenly go, oh, there's no space for the vocal. So actually, often bass drums, then vocal. Or, if there's no vocal, if there's just, what, what's, what's the riff? If it's a, I don't know, if it's, a, if it's a dance track, then maybe then put the riff in. Because what tends to happen is you tend to listen to all these clever little <coughs> things, like the little percussive ideas that only happen maybe once or twice, and they become the focus of your mix. And you tend to forget the things that are really important. Yeah. Um, that's all I have time for. I, if there are any questions, by all means, ask me. Or, or if there are any general questions, reason. So, if any of you missed uh, Matthias's uh, presentation, I hope you don't mind. If there's any questions for you, if there's any, 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 have you got any tips for packing vocals? Because I, I have nightmares. I like layered vocals, but I know there's always a timing issue. Yeah. But it's um, I know you've got some. Yeah, there's a lot of backing vocals in here. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, let's just isolate the chorus, so um, let's just hit P. P is my favourite key. Hey, you're... Right, I didn't say it in June. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's just zip over to the mixer, have a little look. Actually, that's a Lebo. That wasn't even the backing vocals. Um, okay, let's just... I just need to remind myself, sorry. Hey, you're <coughs> so yeah, now, the most important thing, lead vocal and backing vocals, is not to put them in the same space. So, in other words, if you have a very wet lead vocal, quite often what you'll do is have very dry backing vocals. If, you've got very, if you have a very uh, dry lead vocal, then you can probably get away with quite a bit of space on your backing vocals. But the key thing is, with EQ and effects is to, is to put them in a different space to your lead vocal. So that they don't sound, so that when I play those... Take me on, I'll be waiting for you. Don't care. Actually, when I listen to those, weirdly enough now, I think, wow, they don't sound very nice at all. But actually, in the scheme of things, if I were to, if I were to take off the EQ on those... Uh, you fun of us, I don't mind. What I'm doing actually there is I'm taking a bit of what I would call the nastiness. They, they sounded a bit digital to me actually, so what I did was I just took a bit of this area out, the kind of 3 to 4K. Um, weirdly enough, hearing them in here, uh, what frequency we've got here? Up at around about 12K. Now, because this is a shelving band, you can get away with adding quite a lot of this because it's a gentler kind of, it's not like adding something with a, with a fairly steep key where it might sound a little phasey. So if I add. Let's just play that from the beginning again. Hey, you're so it's a bit too much, I don't need that. Take me on, I'll be waiting for you. Don't care if they make fun of us. I don't mind, let's be. So, the key thing with those vocals is to put them in a slightly different space to the lead vocal. Okay. Um, quite often to use different effects on them as well. I mean, there's, there's loads of little tricks you can do to fool people into thinking that something is much cleverer than it is. I mean, it, with vocals, I mean, you could have an eighth note 
delay in the verse, and then maybe you could add an eighth triplet in the B section, and then when you get to the chorus, maybe you add a quarter note. Um, to create that kind of illusion that it's constantly building. Um, any other questions? Yeah, do you think parallel processing as opposed to the electronic sounds, or would you go back to the source instrument and try to sort it there? What do you mean in terms of um, if you need to add, so for instance, yeah. say you have a drum loop or something? Yeah, mostly okay. electronic sound and the synths and reason. Um, do you yeah. think it's worth persisting with parallel processing there? Or yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because the, the cool thing with parallel processing is what it does is it gives you a way of um, keeping your original source quite intact, but then using it, um, and you saw, the, you saw the application there with effects, you can get away with having effects and using them in a, in a far more extreme way because you can EQ that channel. You can EQ the signal that's being sent to those effects. So, yeah, absolutely, I do. I, I, in fact, I, I, I think it probably has even more of an application in, in a way. Um, just to emphasize the point, I've overused it in here a little. Um, but I think, I think it, yeah, I think it's really important, particularly for bass. I, I think it's really good for bass. I, I just wanted to emphasize to you that parallel processing doesn't equal parallel compression. It's one of those things. Um, there's, a, there's quite a well-known American um, Mass engineer called Michael Brower, and he really is the guy that took this to the extreme. In that, what he tends to do is he has he has four mix buses, which he then sums to one mix bus at the end. What he does is he he'll have maybe one flavour of compressor and EQ, and maybe some valve processing or something, and that will be just for bass and drums. Then there'll be another one which will be good for guitars, and there'll be another one good for vocals, and, and maybe another one for guitars, and then the, all of those. Um, all of those buses are then summed together at the end to get your, if you like, your, your composite sound. And the great thing with that is you have a little more control. Um, I know for a fact, I've watched him mixing, and, and uh, with, I mean, probably some of you being from Exeter, you'd probably like to hear Chris Martin's vocal muted rather than that. Uh, but we don't have to go there on that. Um, I'd watch the way he worked. What will happen is he, he'll use one channel and he'll love the compressor, uh, now, if he were to just have one channel on, on his vocal, he wouldn't be able to compress it very much, because what will happen is it will just squash it, and, and you'll lose the integrity of the sound. So therefore, really what you're doing is, you say, well, actually, I can compress that one a lot, and I can add that to the... Actually, quite often what, what mix engineers will do, they'll just filter a little off the bottom end of the lead vocal, and then they'll just use the parallels to kind of enhance that signal. Um, the danger... Is, is to overuse parallel processing. Yeah? Um, needless to say, a door will need to support full um, delay compensation because you just stop adding loads of power. Now, fortunately, Reason's quite DSP and, and CPU efficient and therefore it doesn't, it doesn't really have those problems. Um, but I know for a fact that third party REs, we have talked about that, haven't we? Some of them have a little bit. So you've got to watch out for that. If you start adding too, if you start adding too many parallels, you probably will get into phase um, issues and, 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 as a result, cancellation. That was a long answer to that question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions? I've got one. I've heard a lot of people advocating using only cutting when you EQ, or vast majority of the time cutting, not boosting. Yeah. Um, I do have something to say. I have something to say about everything, don't I? Um, yeah. EQ for me, I, I, I have two separate thoughts about EQ. There's what I call surgical EQ, or corrective EQ, and then there's what I call character EQ. Now, if I'm doing surgical EQ, then I might take more of a parametric approach to that where I'm, say, say I have an acoustic guitar that has a nasty squeak on it or something like that. That for me is a surgical issue, but then what I might do is I might compromise the overall sound, so I may just want to enhance it by brightening it up. Now, those for, for, the, for the character bit, I always treat that very gently, maybe, you know, even 1, 2 dB with a very, very, with, with, a, with a kind of shelving characteristic, if you like. So in other words, none of this kind of, those kind of shapes for you. Because all I'm trying to do is I'm just trying to make the sound maybe breathe a little more. Um, so yes, I do see those as being... Two, two totally separate issues. Um, I think what's happened is 
just going back to your original question, is since we started working in the box, or in the door, um, there unfortunately is a tendency to overload <laughs> levels and not think about gain staging. Now, if you record something and it's banging these meters up at zero dB, well then you have only one way to go really when you're EQing. You have to subtract. Um, I would also like to point out that if you're EQing something, taking away bass is the same thing as kind of adding top quite often. So um, I think if I was working on an analog console, I probably wouldn't think about those things as much. But working in the box, yeah, I probably would use more subtractive EQ. Okay. Right. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you.